Content warning for colonialism and objectification of women. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. monsters were strange enough, but there was something that was stranger. The fact that the people before and after them paid no attention to them. Whatever they were, they were... accepted. They were normal. They belonged here. Here? That word again. Where, what, when was here? What mad universe was this that took for granted an alien race more horrible looking than the worst bug-eyed monster that had ever leered from a science fiction magazine cover? What mad universe was this that gave him $200 for a quarter and tried to kill him when he offered a half dollar free, yet whose credit currency bore a picture of George Washington and current dates which it provided, fortunately still folded it in his pocket, current and only subtly different issues of surprising stories and perfect love stories, a world with asthmatic bottle T Fords and space travel? Hi, I'm Adam, and this is Phil. Hello. And hello. <laughs> so we're going to be uh, trying this out, this uh, podcast, where we talk about um, uh, Pulp Through the Ages, uh, which uh, is a an interesting... Uh, co- what is Pulp, exactly? It's something that, I mean, we'll probably try to define as we go on. But generally speaking, it's the idea of um, sort of uh, cheaply produced mass literature, uh Originally, it came down to the specific paper that it was printed on, right? The yep. pulp versus the slicks, the magazines. Uh, but, I mean, you, it goes back to the uh, 19th, even the 18th century, I mm-hmm. think. Um, Phil's the expert on the older stuff. I'm a little better on the newer, the 20th century type stuff. Um, so we've got, uh, we're going to look through the ages at uh, pulp uh, pulp. Uh, writings that have existed in the sci-fi fantasy genre specifically and uh, how it relates to the uh, stuff that we've uh, uh, that we read and consume in our modern uh, modern time here Um, because of course that is the ground zero for pop culture most of this stuff Um, so uh, uh, as I say uh, we're just two nerds in a basement uh, discussing about this stuff and uh, so the, the book that we're looking at right here that is the first book is uh, called what mad universe and it is the basis for probably the title of this podcast uh and it's kind of an interesting one to start with uh phil discovered it so phil why don't you tell us about this book here what mad universe uh well uh it's a uh first of all it's by frederick brown from 1949 Mm -hmm. we should say the author that's yes exactly um it's a um parody of um uh, at the time, the uh, space opera type literature at the time. This is before Star Wars and Star Trek that sort of cemented the genre into what it is today. So it's it's more a parody of what it was at the time. But uh, that that's an interesting uh, look into um, how these things were viewed. Right. In yeah. the in the late forties, yeah, it's a self aware book. It's talking about like the hero is literally a pulp writer. So this is like, you know, well over if you want to say fifty years or even one hundred fifty years of this kind of pulp had already existed at this point. So they were kind of riffing on it in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, in the book, it's set a little bit into the future, but not much. Uh, 
It was written, into their future. Into, into their, 1950, yeah. which was yeah. the future in 1949. Yeah, it's it's yeah. set in 1954. Mm. Um, a um, science fiction magazine editor named Keith Winton, um, who is kind of a generic character, but uh, he's really just there to bounce off all the weird stuff that happens. Yeah, he's an um, author insert kind of character. Yeah, basically. yeah, very much so. Um, he There's a... Um, Rocket headed to the moon that has a, um, uh, let's see, what's it called? The Burton uh, potentiometer uh, <laughs> that's supposed to build up an electrical charge and make a sort of explosion that's brighter than a bomb but less destructive. But there's an accident and it falls to Earth on top of Winton. Right. Well, he's at his uh, publisher's country yeah, club. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, this sends him into a parallel universe right. where um, uh, all these science fiction genre conventions are real. Mm-hmm. Um, the Earth is pretty much, uh, I mean, cars are still cars. Everything seems normal at first, but then he starts noticing strange things. Like they use credits instead of dollars. Um, and... Uh, they're, of course, a giant, a seven-foot-tall purple alien. Yeah, that's the real... Uh, yeah. <laughs> when when he's attacked by a giant seven-foot-tall purple alien, that's he, when he realizes yeah, he's yeah. not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, he manages to uh, make it back to New York through some... Uh, oh, sorry, I should mention... Uh, this Earth is uh, supposedly at war with, or not supposedly, it's at war with uh, Arcturus, or something. Arcturus. Yeah, Arcturus. Yeah. Um, it's it's never quite clear in the book what the Arcturans look like. Well, the point of the Arcturans yeah. is that they're, they're so, so horrifying yeah. and you can't look at them or whatever. They're Lovecraftian. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that's that's sort of later. This yeah. is, of course, he's he's thrust into this world and he's kind of finding his way around and uh, yeah, trying he's to figure a, out what the hell is going on. Mistaken for a spy because he he uh, uses a, uh, coins mm-hmm. when those have apparently been banned. Right. Um, and uh, uh, which we'll get into later. Yeah. Uh, but he makes it back to New York, and uh, it's completely blacked out like literally like you can't see anything um because uh well we'll discuss that later as well right um but uh, he finds his way through um anyway i'm going into it a bit too uh no, it's good. You're good. beat by beat yeah just um, just general just broad strokes. yeah yeah broad strokes uh basically this is a parallel universe that uh, has gone to war with arcturus right um but uh, it, it diverges a bit earlier than that. Um, in, uh, yeah, uh, it, like I said, it's, it's very uh, lighthearted and comedic. The um, uh, divergent point is the invention of the space warp drive, which was discovered by a scientist working on sewing machines. Right, right. Well, it's, it's well. No, hang on. It, it, yeah, you can go go describe the plot. That's fine. Okay, as you, as you were doing. That's fine. yeah, yeah. That's he fine. discovers. Uh, well, this is at that point yeah. anyway. Yeah, he's sorry, a... new at this, folks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, basically, he just he goes like there's all he, things get crazier and crazier. Like when he goes to New York every night, uh, very early in the day. Uh, basically, as soon as the sun sets, everything's turned into a huge blackout, and literally you can't see, you know, two feet in front of your face in New York. Uh, then it's and there's roving gangs that will apparently murder you for nothing. And, right, as uh, makes yeah, makes a certain amount of sense. If the yeah, things that they're are. they're called what were the the nighters, right? Nighters, yeah, uh, and they use sticks to locate themselves. Right, and, right, and yeah, there's other, and then the other thing, uh, the other big thing is that he encounters a parade, and they, everyone's sort of raving about this one guy named uh, Dopel. Uh, Dopel who is, uh, seems to be essentially this world's Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers yeah. uh, superhero who everyone admires, and he's got the most... Uh, he's he's uh, engaged to a girl who is a girl that Keith Winton himself has a huge crush on yeah. in our world, yeah. um, who is his, uh, who's, who's a fellow editor of the romance uh, uh, publication down the hall. Um, and she, here she's, his, she's the... Uh, what was Flash Gordon's? Uh, Dale... Uh, Dopel. 
Yeah, but what was Do- Flash Gordon's? Uh, oh, love Dale interest? Arden. Dale Arden, yes. Yeah. So she is to Dopel as Dale Arden is to Flash Gordon, basically. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, she wears, you know, those skimpy clothing that right. uh, um, that they wear in sci-fi magazines. Right. Yeah. They <laughs> makes a big thing out yeah. of how. Why is she wearing a space bikini, basically? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and uh, leers at her quite a lot in the prose. Um, and then there's also a robot sphere that Dopel has created, which telepathically uh, communicates Mechel. him. Mechel. Me- Mech. What was it? Mecho or Mech? Mechel. One second, I'll find it here. Mechie, 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 yeah, my, that's right. My, my mistake. And uh, yeah, so they f- and that and they see Mechie, and Mechie actually communicates with them telepathically, and that's the first sort of sense he gets to talk to anyone who kind of goes, and Mechie kind of goes, "Oh, I see your mind, and I see that you're from another universe, and this is really interesting. Hey, I'll help you out in a month, okay? Come yeah. back and see me in a month." And he takes off, and <laughs> he's like, "What the hell? Hey, come back! What are you doing?" Anyway, yeah, um, Mechie is uh, is integral to the war effort. So. Right, right. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, because he was the creation, he's the, he's, uh, Dopel's, uh, sci-fi sidekick, robot sidekick, yeah. a more competent R2-D2, I guess, mm-hmm. if you like. There was one, uh, comment about Dopel I liked in the book where, uh, Keith muses that, uh, this character is too unrealistic even for one of his stories, like right. he would tell the writer to yeah, come t- back and give him some flaws or something. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's definitely a commentary on the pulp, uh, yeah. the super heroic uh, aspect of the pulp uh, characters there. Anyway, so he's he this guy is sort of uh, stumbling around, Keith Winden, stumbling around through all these uh, these adventures and slowly encountering all the craziness of this world. And he finally, he, when he encounters Mechie, he realizes, no, i got to track down... Um, sorry, what's the girl's name again? Um... um... Oh, sir. Betty Hadley. Betty Hadley. He's got to find her, he's got to find Mechie, and they'll be his ticket out of here, basically. But it's it's a story where a big chunk of it is loca- is him slowly realizing something as weird is happening with the, st- with the world that he's in, and then he starts to encounter the weird things, and then it's like, oh my god, I'm... Yeah, a lot of it's, because uh, he has to keep it secret, right. or, I mean, he can't, can't tell anybody because they think he'd... Cre- think he's crazy well no it's more they think he's a spy well right they the think bat. he's a spy but they also <laughs> if he told anybody no yeah. i'm just from another universe they think he's crazy so he's right. sort of in a bind right so he's kind of got to fake his way through the world without knowing what the rules are exactly yeah so it's one of those kind of stories and he's trying to figure out and there's and every so often something completely insane will happen like discovering that everything goes dark in new york at night um and then slowly they you know, it, and, and it's basically that, and it's him hunting for a spaceship to get off world is like ninety five percent of the story. Basically, mm-hmm. uh, I was really surprised actually by the time it got to um, he got to a point where he could get a, a spaceship and get off world. There were like ten pages left in the story. It gets yeah. really, it gets really hyper accelerated, and yet they wrap it up fairly eloquently and yep. in that very short period of time. I was, I was surprised. Um, sorry, go on. T- tell him what happens, what the revelation is once he gets to, uh, to, uh, uh, Dopel and, and the Oh, yeah, fleet. uh, yeah, Mackie talks about, uh, uh, basically when he was, um, when the rocket fell on his head, he was thinking about one of the fans who writes into the magazine named Joe Doppelberg. Right. And, uh, he was thinking about Joe Doppelberg and the kind of stories that, uh, this, this uh, obsessive fan would want to read about. Right. So when the missile fell on his head, he was transported to that reality. Right. Not like a because uh, according to Mechie, every single reality that it can be conceived of actually exists. Right. Exactly. Uh, the chapter and the chapter names in this book are hilarious, but this one, this chapter was called Huckleberry Infinity. <laughs> Huckleberry. Because Infinity. Uh, uh, the plot of Huckleberry Finn has happened. Uh, in an infinite amount of universes, right? Every, because everything is duplicated an infinite amount of times. So right. That, that's, everything you can conceive of has happened. Yeah, that's kind of the, the 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 big clever reveal of the book is the idea that well, if there's an infinite number of realities and everything you can possibly imagine happens in one of the infinite realities, then every book and every story you could ever imagine must exist <laughs> in reality. Uh, although I do, I do kind of question that a little because if it's physically impossible, would it really have happened? Um, uh, it would have different rules of 
physics. Uh, that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's, I mean, we don't know exactly how it works, yeah. but that's right. And, and I mean, it's it, it's basically you know, I guess you could build a because in, in this and universe, there's Martians and lo- Moon people, so exactly, it yeah. already has different rules of physics. Right. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. So, but that's true. You mean you could have an alternate reality where for some reason the moon had an atmosphere or yeah. something and yeah exactly so it's that is kind of the big you know uh the big reveal is because of, of course he spends a lot of the, the 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 first chunk of the book going wait a minute i'm in one of a, a pulp story i must be am i in a coma and dreaming all this yeah. like there must be something like that but then he's also like but wait a minute i could i don't want doesn't mean i want to walk jump off a building and die and that'll wake me you know because i could be yeah I could be actually. What, what's his rationale again? He has a rationale for it. Like uh, I can't remember that bit. But. For he he basically says yeah he 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 keeps occasionally going. This really feels like I'm trapped in a crazy story, but something's telling me not to just pretend that I'm in a story and, mm-hmm. and smash my way through it. Uh, because, but yeah, this is. But what what I found really interesting about this is uh, the reality he went into is what. Uh, editor imagines a fan wants right so exactly. it's not just what yeah. a fan wants it's what the editor is imagining the fan wants it's sort of a few steps removed yeah exactly So like um this fan had met the uh, secretary at his uh at his office mm-hmm. but hadn't actually met him face to face right so he exists in this in this other universe but he looks different right that's right it's yeah so keith exists that's right. It wasn't. She wasn't the secretary. She's the other editor, uh, Betty. Uh, no, yeah. no, it's the secretary and the the editor as well. But Betty. Oh, as well. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's yeah. It's it's him. Betty was even more attractive than she was in real life. Right. Apparently. Exactly. Yeah. This is him going. Um, yeah. So if that guy had written a story, basically. Yeah. Uh, this is what he would. He would write the story in which he was the uh, you know muscular yeah. ripping. Yeah. Joe Doppelberg to Dopel so, becomes Dopel. Yeah. yeah. So he he would, when he finally meets Dopel, he realizes. Oh wait, you're Joe Doppelberg. That's when it all falls into place. Yeah. Uh, so he would write the story in which he was the. It's not even really fair to Doppelberg because this isn't specifically what Doppelberg did. It's just no. what he thinks Doppelberg would yeah. write. But he writes the story in which he's the fake, uh, the the big super brawny masculine hero. Uh, the the girl down the hall is who. Keith is in love with, but also, uh, you know, Doppelberg would probably have seen her, and he imagines he would have fallen in love with yeah. her as well, so she's the super, uh, you know, ideally idealized uh, dream woman, uh, and it would have, all... but then Keith Winton himself exists in this reality, but they'd never met, so uh, he... Keith Winton looks completely different and is basically a different person yeah. than the real Keith Winton, or the Keith Winton from our reality. Yeah. Uh, which gets him into trouble at one point because he actually he starts to think I can make a living writing pulp stories. Yeah. Oh, uh, that that's an interesting thing to talk about in in this um, the way it deals with fiction within the fiction. Right. Because um, uh, you know it's a meta story that's that's commenting on pulp tropes, right. but also the pulp within the world mm-hmm. uh, is sort of realistic in a way. Right. Because they're they're. Uh, they don't have as many science fi- like this. The magazine that uh, that Keith uh, edits in this in the Mad Universe is uh, not a science fiction magazine. It's an, a real adventure magazine. Right, but it's a world. But it's set in space. Right, you know, because people go to space in this universe. Right, it's a world where if you're writing a Flash Gordon type story. It's probably real history, or at least based yeah. on. So it'd be like the equivalent of writing a western. Yeah, in, in it our says world. there are science fiction, but it's based on things that haven't been invented yet, like right. time travel or, uh, or travel to other galaxies that haven't been discovered yet. But right. that it's still rarer than the adventure fiction stuff. But it would be harder for one of us to tell the difference between sci-fi and a historical story yeah. in this world. But to everyone else, it's obvious. But to us, we're going. <laughs> Yeah, I really like it when stories do stuff like that. Like right. Watchmen has the uh, pirate comics instead right. of superhero comics. Right. And I, I hate... Well, I guess it depends on the tone of the story, but like, I don't know. Uh, I heard about uh, Bright doing... Um, uh, mentioning Shrek in the right. movie. Like, <laughs> yes. that makes no sense. Right. The, why would Shrek exist yeah. in a world where... Because that, that would be a recent move, right. movie and... Uh, right. Uh, you know... Race relations, if, if the orc human relations are supposed to mirror. Well, sh- <laughs> if we're going to talk about that, Shrek 
you know, to be honest, if Shrek existed in the universe of Bright, it would be a very, uh, it would be like a guess who's coming to dinner or something. Yeah, yeah. It would be a plea for a tolerance of ogres, basically. Oh, yeah, I guess. But it <laughs> I still mean, it would existed, be pretty racist. No, it would. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense. And yeah. it's because Will Smith uh, improvised, improvised the line. Yeah, but line, they still so. kept, they still put it in. Anyway, yeah, enough yeah. about Bright. I haven't actually seen it. <laughs> that's uh, fair. But no, it's comparable. It is, that, that is, yeah. what, that's right. It's basically uh, in the same ballpark. But I guess, uh, you know, some like Venture Brothers does this too, but I that's more comedic. Like it'll mention the Fantastic Four when there's a version of the Fantastic Four that exists uh, in the universe. I get yeah, that's right. Um, so they that, have comics, that, but that's a comedy. You that's know, that's just and that's just a throwaway too. That's yeah. not a huge part of what they're doing. No, this is really getting into okay. What would the fiction look like in yeah, the science yeah, it's really fiction? Thought. Uh, there's a lot of thought put into it, obviously. Right, and again, because the main character is a uh, science fiction editor, so of course that's kind of his wheelhouse. So he's he's focusing on that. And there's, like I say, as a whole chunk of the book uh, where he's he literally thinks, "Well, I'm going to be stranded here for a while. Uh, I can write uh, stories, yeah, um, which uh, and then make money from that, which yeah. you could do in the forties. Ah, the ah, uh, the age when you could like crank <laughs> out stories and make money from yeah. A thing. So he already had some that he had written before, so he was able to just yeah type them out again from memory, right, or roughly from memory, right. But he takes them towards to the other Keith. And, well, just just oh, to be sorry. just to be really specific, yeah, he's 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 come up with these. He remembers stories he wrote in the past and rejected or were rejected. But he goes, "I'm older now. I can rewrite them and they'll be better. And that way, I can grind them out faster because I've already written these stories." Basically, mm-hmm. so he goes, "Oh, this is great. I can. That'll be my way of making a living." Anyway, go on. Sorry. Yeah, so, so he goes to the he, he submits them, and uh, the other Keith says, "These are pretty much the same plots and." sometimes character names and stuff i had written in the past so. right yeah that's that's really great it's here because there's like i say there's another keith witten in this reality so he goes he submits this uh this stuff to the other keith witten and the other keith witten's like hey i wrote all these stories and he goes oh damn why didn't i think of that of course the other guy yeah. wrote all the stories that i was just trying to write because he's me yeah and it's that's actually really funny that yeah, he does, yeah. That he says that and he's like oh right why didn't anyone think of that and, he, and you think he's got the this clever in because he's from another reality and then he realizes that he's he's sabotaged himself basically yeah. that's one of the that's you can see him kind of uh when you're reading this story like i say the pacing is a little weird because he's spending so much time and then suddenly everything you know comes through at the end but you can see that he likes to spend time thinking through that aspect of the sci-fi reality yeah uh so that is really kind of the focus of the book which is kind of well there there is a lot of thinking about how things would function uh i guess i i mentioned earlier the the point where the universe diverges Mm -hmm. um and it's sometime in the uh victorian era i can't remember the date the date is written in the book but i (laughs) Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Sometime in the Victorian era, a scientist pre pre Wright brothers. I yeah. Think. Yeah. A scientist was working on sewing machines and mm. put a type of electrical charge into one of them, and mm. it disappeared. Right. And uh, they found it. They they he started doing it again and again, and they started finding them miles away, uh, damaged, like uh-huh. completely destroyed. Um, and it seems that he had discovered faster than light travel. Right. A warp drive through sewing machines. Right. And um, it seems contact with the air when they um, uh, came, popped back into existence is what blew them up. So they can um, go through space, the right. vacuum of spe- space. by uh, So they can disappear on Earth and arrive into space, but they have to land on Earth. Yeah. Or land on a planet. Right. Yeah. So so it's, yeah, it's, it's via this sewing machine he discovered a way to basically leap through hyperspace i don't remember what they call it specifically uh, warp drive warp drive yeah so this is before star trek yeah that's, that's right that seems to have been a, a thing that's uh, that star trek kind of copied on yeah warping and yeah. The, the funny thing about the idea of warping space is they think there's actually a uh physical like in in physics uh possibility of doing something like mm-hmm. that for real like the uh, if you've ever heard of the uh, alcubierre uh drive uh, there's a gen- uh, I don't know anything about physics. Well, there's a guy called uh, Alcubierre who's a French uh, physicist, astrophysicist, uh, and he actually did apparently write out a mathematical proof for the ability to move faster than the speed of light. Okay. So it's at least mathematically possible, mm-hmm. uh, and it would in fact involve something that could 
be interpreted as a quote warp drive because mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it literally is. Well, I read something about how Star Trek's warp drive supposedly works in universe. Right. It creates a bubble around it that time works differently. So right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. Yeah. This is from what I understand. That's sort of how this apparently works. Okay. Um. Which is really fascinating because this was in the nineties that he came up with it. Okay. So Star Trek had been doing that. Now all I can think of is he was probably building off what other people had done decades before. Mm-hmm. But that still suggests that Star Trek was really paying attention to some cutting edge physics in the sixties to come up with something like that. Yeah. Um, but like yeah. the gangster planet that exists. The gangster, well, you know, the gangster <laughs> planet is because we had a back lot full of uh, costumes yeah. that we needed. That's why they go to the gladiator planet and the gangster planet. And uh, the I wish planet. I wish those planets came back yeah. for yeah. other series because yeah. they ignore them completely after, to my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, yes and no. Well, that's because they have the holodeck in the later ones. Yeah, so they don't need a gangster planet. Yeah. They just go on the holodeck and do the gangster. But, uh, I would have loved them to have a crew member. You know, yeah. I, I think. I think I was talking about this on Twitter, and somebody said uh, a crew member like Lieutenant Lieutenant Bugsy from the yeah. Gangster Planet. The, the Gangster Planet. Well, if I'm not mistaken, we're getting off topic oh, here a sorry. little bit. No, no, no. But I, <coughs> it, it is funny, and it is related to Pulp Sci-Fi. Yeah. But um, the the um, something somewhere because that was the planet Sigma Iodia, and the, the Gangster Planet was based on the idea that somebody left behind a book. Yeah, from yeah Earth, I remember that. And that inspired them to build their entire civilization around uh, Chicago gangs of the 20s. Yeah. Um, so somebody, and the, if I recall correctly, that episode ends with them having found a Starfleet communicator. Um Maybe I'm maybe I'm imagining that, and that's not in the episode. No, that 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 is in that one. But say yeah. the Roman planet was. No, no, the that, Roman planet yeah. is different. But I but the gladi the the gangster planet. The point is, uh, I think a video game or something or a or a spinoff novel or something had them go back to that planet, oh, okay. and suddenly it was all like a Star Trek planet because they based oh, everything okay. on listening to. So it was almost Galaxy Quest uh, years <laughs> before Galaxy Quest. They were listening in on Star Trek. Star Trek uh, broadcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, via this communicator for decades, and that became the basis of their society. So it was this uh, cargo cult version of the Federation when they went back to this planet, which is uh, a really funny idea, I think. Um, speaking of Galaxy Quest, this book, is, this back, going back to what Mad Universe, yeah, yeah, is uh, very much sort of a Galaxy Quest of its time. That's right, yeah. Uh, though I don't think it was very popular at the time. It was like yeah. it, it won it won some awards when it came out, but uh, oh, did it? Or something like that. The it got in crit- critics' lists or something. Well, that's interesting if there's there were awards for Pulp back in the day. Um, oh, I could be wrong, but I remember it being well-received by at least... No, there, there the probably know. were. Yeah. I'd be I'd be interested to know if mm-hmm. there were... Because, I mean, by the time you get to the mid-40s and 50s, uh, and this is actually something that's really interesting about Pulp in the 20th century to me, is that... There's less and less of a, there's this brief period where there's less and less of a line between a high literature and pulpy literature, and especially when you get to the '60s, there were people who you know you'd have some guy who was writing Flash Gordon crap versus right next to like Kurt Vonnegut, like Kurt Vonnegut got started in the pulps. Yeah, Ray Bradbury got started in the pulps. And of course, 2001: Space Odyssey and. Uh, yeah, he, he yeah. well, not just I'm not just talking about yeah sci-fi in general, yeah. of course, but even just the idea that you could be a pulp writer and yeah, you could yeah, kind yeah. of and that's true. And that's of, very um, much Kurt Vonnegut, like his Kilgore Trout character, is right. sort of a. That's kind of yeah. the whole point of yeah, Kilgore Trout yeah. he is that he was a he was trying to write serious stories about real the human condition, but he was doing it in the trashiest venue that and that because that's all he could get published in. yeah um and that's actually an interesting thing about pulp so but i think by the time you get to the 40s you've obviously got a certain uh wit going on it wasn't just um like the uh, from what i understand edgar rice burroughs back in the very late uh, 19th early 20th century yeah. uh he was kind of um he was kind of looking down on pulp and he was kind of all i'll do it better than than everyone else is doing. Uh, that's how I'd always heard uh, is his at was his attitude to pulp, and I think it was seen as oh yeah, this is this trash for illiterates, and you know it's it's garbage and it's not real literature. This book, What Mad Universe, it's coming from a post war era where it doesn't feel snobby to well, it does a little. It's kind of mocking pulp. Yeah, but, but it, it's it's a loving mocking. Yeah, it's yeah. done it in a way where it expects its audience to be somewhat sophisticated. Yeah, and yet it is a pulp story, so it's not written as if, uh, oh yeah, this this is for the it's, low it's obviously pulp audience. I mean, 
it was written by a editor of pulp so, right uh so but it even if you didn't know that it's obviously written from the point of view of somebody who knows a lot about this subject right that's why it, it's, it's not it's not a shallow parody it's it's a very yeah yeah that's that's what's interesting about it is that it, yeah it, and it kind of <laughs> yeah it's kind of letting the audience in on the joke as it were yeah uh, in a way that you see in today's media all the time uh, but if for 1949 it's a bit surprising to see yeah, it basically yeah. that you wouldn't see uh, like I said Galaxy Quest or um, what, what's a, what's a good example of it, it's not Galaxy Quest. Exactly, because Galaxy Quest is almost the opposite. It's the people who are unaware they're in a science fiction yeah, universe yeah. for a while. Uh, but but this is kind of like, I almost want to say Scream. Yeah, it's a bit like Scream of a pulp sci-fi fiction, you know what okay, I mean? Okay, I haven't actually seen the Scream movies. Oh, you've never seen Scream? No. Well, it's the... Pa- the I, I know of it. I, I know the, it's meta-commentary and horror stuff, but... Well, the, well, the idea of the main character Not really sort of going, fan, I'm in so. a... It, it, but, well, it's the main character is kind of going. We're in a, in this case, horror movie. Uh, how could we can survive because we know the rules of a horror movie? Oh, okay. So that will help us uh, go, get from point A to point B. In this okay. case, survive. Uh, in this one, it's I'm in a pulp store, a pulp science fiction story. I know pulp science fiction stories, so I can kind of <laughs> obey the rules of a pulp science fiction story. Mm-hmm. But then there's also like there's things. Again, it's about things he hadn't necessarily thought of. Yeah. would exist in the pulp science fiction story. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, we'll, we'll explain the blackout, I suppose. Yeah. Um, the, uh, oh, uh, let's go back to the... No, explain the blackout. That's fine. Okay. We don't, we don't need to do this linearly. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so the blackout is to stop, is sort of like the, um, uh, turn, in, turn off those lights during World War II. Right, yeah, it's, it's but it's not but on a grander scale because it actually does make everything completely black. Right, uh, to uh, cause the turn Arcturans not to be able to uh, see what's going on. Right, uh, and this is done in the cities. Right, the major cities. Um, yeah, because the they they the Ar- destroyed Chicago and Rome, I believe. Right, uh, and uh, then a scientist discovered the blackout technology. Right, they called it epsilon gas or something like that. Right. Um, and uh, and this is just after World War Two, so that probably would have been fresh and well. Yeah, and again, if you think of it as a meadow pulp universe, that's in itself being created by someone who's imagining what a pulp universe would be like. It almost becomes one of these things where something we encounter in real life, but exaggerated to science fictional degrees. Yeah, like the blackout during the Blitz or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, which Americans didn't experience, but still the same basic idea. But still, it's, right over. you know, yeah, they knew about it. Yeah, no, uh, it's definitely a commentary on yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, as I say, it's not even just that they did, like, you know, 30 years earlier, they might have done it as the sci-fi version of something that exists in the real world. Here, it's like a commentary on how people would conceive of a sci-fi thing uh, using pulp, right? Like they would have taken, yeah. like, oh, they would have taken something that we know of in our world and turned it into a sci-fi thing. Yeah. Uh, but like the blackout. Anyway, go on. Um, so, yeah, you were going to say something. Yeah. Else. So, um, uh, back to, uh, they invented the, the sewing machine space travel. Right. And, uh, first they went to the moon where they discovered seven foot tall purple alien, right. Alien men. Uh, and they, in th- the the book sort of uh, in describing the history of of this world, uh, it does it through an H. G. Wells article, right? In, in universe, H. G. Wells wrote an right. article on the history of the world, right? Um, and it takes this sort of anti colonialist view for a bit, right? Um, well, that's the other thing. I, that's that's really interesting because the guy knew that H.G. Wells was an anti-colonialist yeah. in real life. And he actually mentions that straight up. And they, there's even a point in this book where he talks about, he's the same thing. It's like, oh, you know, it is funny how we tend to invade other countries and and, and take all their resources and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, it's actually sympathetic to that point of view. Yeah, so they do that to the moon people, the uh, Lunans, I think they're called. The Lunans, yeah. Because their moon people always have different names in every yeah. book I've read. right. Um, selenites, lunarians, mm-hmm. I've even come across lunatics. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, then they went to Venus, and, yeah. uh, oh, oh, the, the moon people are very, uh, primitive. Right. Uh, I guess, you know, quote-unquote primitive, and yeah. they were easily exploitable. 
and but they tried to bring them back to earth for as laborers but they seem to die when they're right after three weeks for some reason right or something like that the moon people did yeah the moon people did how was it that they were able to because they've got moon people all over the planet oh yeah but they're it's only for short periods of time it's sort of vacation oh okay so moon people come to earth for a vacation and go back to right the okay moon. they can't survive for more than i think it was six weeks oh okay all right um so okay. yeah all right um so uh they go to venus and discover uh nomadic people and mm -hmm. they're able to colonize that planet as well right then they go to mars and uh they discover people who are just as advanced, right? But hadn't discovered space travel because they don't have clothes and wouldn't have had sewing machines, right? Again, Martians without clothes, right? Right. Um, might have been a reference to Edgar Rice Burroughs. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, right. Could um, be. It's a common thing. Yeah. Um, the Martians uh, uh, also seem to die off planet, but it's more of a willed thing. I right. don't want to take, be captured or anything. Right. So the entire war was fought on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Earth won because uh, the Martians surrendered because they didn't want to be uh, wiped out completely. Right. So they eventually uh, surrendered. So that was the first interplanetary war. And then, um, by chance, uh, Earth vessels happen across uh, ones from Arcturus. Right. And uh, here they found... Not just an equally advanced society, but a more advanced society. Right. And they, of course, instantly went to war, and it became a war of attrition. But they captured some Arcturan ships, and they're basically technologically even at right. the start of the story. Because of Dopel is keeping them a, a, a pace. Because yeah. Because they started yeah. off with the Arcturians being more advanced than yeah. us, right? And then Dopel. But yeah, no, just going back, though, it is really interesting, because he has a whole... He, he's, he's seeing it through the filter of H.G. Wells, and H.G. Wells was a... Uh, he was a socialist. He was very... I mean, the whole point of War on the Worlds is basically kind yeah. of an anti-colonialist uh, yeah. narrative. In fact, it's blatantly obvious. Like, it says that outright in the first right. chapter. Right. And he's... Yeah, he's not subtle about it. But it, although, you know, they don't usually play it up in adaptations. Yeah, but and that's, people uh, usually miss the point. And I, I've read some sort of unauthorized sequels to it. And, right. Uh, they just have, like, America, rah, 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 go to war against the Martians. And right. Then, yeah. Or France in one case, but yeah. <laughs> France will destroy the Martians. But yeah, that's but that's just interesting and in that yeah, this this book kind of stops for a, a bit in the middle and again, through the lens of H.G. Wells, but obviously, you know, it's through the the author of the book itself, uh, is talking and or Keith as the main character of the book. They say the same thing. It's like, yeah, you know, we're it kind of portrays humans as the bad guys for a stretch there, yeah. And then it kind of flips over and keeps going. But it's, but again, the whole point is that he thinks this universe is crazy and mixed up, and, yeah, and nutty. But he basically just acknowledges, yeah, we kind of come crashing into a place and uh, exploit all the resources and uh, fuck up the natives, and yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> like it always seems. To but happen it, that it way. is, yeah, it's more thoughtful than you would expect from right. 1949. Right. But uh, I mean, H.G. Wells was doing similar stuff earlier, but. It's still, uh... It's just interesting to yeah. read in a pulp novel, yeah. uh, as I say. But it does show that there is a level of sophistication there. Uh, but I, I, I would I would argue, I mean, again, that's been a strain of human thought for centuries. Yeah. Um, so it's not like it's that radically new. But you tend to you tend to associate pulp, I guess, with more reactionary stuff. Yeah. Um, and being more, you know, and like, yes, we must conquer the evil aliens and they must be bad because they're ugly and evil ha, ha, yeah ha. and i mean it shows you that by 1949 they were already thinking <laughs> like come on guys this doesn't make any sense why are we making them bad because they look ugly or whatever yeah and it, it it does actually show to me how because then you could look at later like comics and things and they they don't think about they they didn't build on that thought they just went yeah. back to oh the ugly evil aliens we must destroy yeah, them as stand-ins for communists or whatever yeah exactly or even well there's one story i remember somebody quoting it was a it was a comic book story uh from around the 50s or 60s and uh basically they were at war with this one alien race who they didn't humans were at war with this alien race they never saw them they fought mm. them in their ships then a third alien race attacks and they're all these ugly monsters and then the the, the other race they'd been fighting comes to their aid and they take off their masks and they all look like humans. 
and it's like, oh, you see, we had this in common all the time. Now let's kill those ugly alien people. And it's kind of like, okay, some mixed messages here, guys. Because yeah. you're saying, get along with the aliens, but only if they look exactly like humans. Yeah. It was kind of, like, the fact that they look like humans was a, was used to literally portray them as, and well, I they're good, white really. And too. Yeah, I mean, yes, goes without saying. They were white. I oh, mean, so uh, were all the humans who... Speaking of, uh, yeah. this book, uh, well, uh, forward thinking on some issues, <laughs> um, is... It's pretty sexist, right? Um, in its treat, because it's got two female characters with speaking lines. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. It's... The secretary and Betty. Yeah. You know, yeah. I Bet... can't remember the secretary's name, but yeah. Yeah. And Betty's very objectified in the story. Very and, objectified. Oh, and there's like one black character is like a servant or something. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, I mean, that's something. Unfortunately, I think that's gonna come up oh, yeah, repeatedly if yes. we're talking about pulp. Uh, it it gets to, worse than this. We always have to put up a big warning that this is old stuff. This is uh, t- yeah, time. This, is, this can, is more of a matter of lack yeah. of representation than yeah. in terms of race. Than, and it is very much, and again, this is kind of the point, but he does leer over Betty as the narrator, as the uh, Keith, as the narrator of the story is constantly, uh, you know, having a heart attack over Betty and how sexy she is, you know, yeah. basically. So uh, he's he's writing very, uh, very uh, leeringly of her all the time. Mm. But it, but again, that's kind of the meta commentary in that they're saying yeah. in pulp sci-fi, they're always running around space bikinis and they're all these, the, because he talks about, he actually, he spends a bit of time talking about as well, the, the painted covers. Yeah. Uh, and the BEMs, as he says, the BEMs, the bug-eyed monsters who always had to be featured on the covers uh, and how in this world they were more plausible and realistic because they were being painted from life, basically. Yeah. Um, and he talked about how, you know, it would be a cheesy story, but then it would have this... It, he, I think it's literally he remembers one issue of the magazine that he had put out with a story in it and how it had, had not the best cover... Oh, no, it's it's one artist whose work he yeah, wasn't a yeah. huge fan of. Yeah. Uh, but then in this world, it's the same artist, but his monsters are way better. Yeah, but it's because, because he has real life reference. Life. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that kind of thing. And it's the same thing with, you know, so like all the women are supernaturally, or not all the women, but the women who are the focus of the story are supernaturally beautiful and everything. Yeah. And Opel himself is the superhuman, unstoppable, awesome dude. Yeah. Um, so it's that aspect of it. And he does talk about how the rest of the world is very normal, but then there's this yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing I like the the contrast between mundane things. Right. Like there aren't flying cars in this world because right. they don't have that technology. Right. They they have regular gas powered cars. It just they have this extra space thing that only works in space. Right. Right. Yeah. They, you've got to get a you've got to get a special space uh, ship to go to outer space. Yeah. Which then has to take off more or less like an airplane. No, no, it space. takes off. It teleports from Earth, but it has to land like a. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. That's right. You have to. That's right. Because it can't land in an atmosphere, or you, there's some complicated procedure uh, that it gets. Air makes it blow up when it re-enters <laughs> the air around it. Yeah. So it glides it, down, right? That's the idea. Yeah. It doesn't really have an engine. It just or yeah, it does. It does, but yeah, not not very strong engine. Yeah. Uh, it you know it's the leaps are just. This is actually interesting because in the in the pulp. Uh, stories of in general you often you'll see people and this is coming out of what was called the golden age of science fiction at the time the mm-hmm. 40s and 50s um where uh, like where uh, uh what's his name john w campbell was kind of the dominating and isaac asimov mm-hmm. uh where they were very focused on how does this work yeah how is this how, technically how does it work and uh, supposedly i've never actually read uh, astounding of the era uh, I used to read Analog, which is actually what uh, An- Astounding evolved into. But I know that a, a, a big complaint about that era, that uh, post immediate post-war era, uh, is that they're very focused on what they thought of as hard sci-fi, and they mm-hmm. get very heavily into the technical details, which are already which are now dated. Even yeah. ten years later, they were dated, um, and so that the story becomes very hard to read because it's much. It's all about the technical details. But I think to a certain extent, you can go into how does this work, and this book actually does go into that a little bit, yeah. like how the sew the the sewing machine space warp works. I yeah. mean, it's based on a ludicrous idea yeah. to begin with, but also like how do you land the plane, uh, the space planes that you have basically, yeah. uh, because like oh you can fall towards, and if you're not if you haven't corrected, you, you could fall towards a planet, and if you haven't corrected your um, 
your angle of descent properly, you can just leap back out into their space yeah, again yeah, and, and correct again. it again yeah. and try again, basically. And he's like, oh, this is why it's so easy to fly. You know, you just need to push the button, and if you're not doing it properly, you just go back. Yeah. So that was kind of, like that's where it gets interesting. I'm in favor. I'm I like that. Uh, some people say, oh, I don't want to hear techno sci-fi, and any even today, you know, I don't want to hear about the technical side of things. But I'm I'm in favor of a certain level of yeah thinking, thinking it through. It th- yeah, thinking it through. Yeah, and and like I say, that's not the point of the story. It's just a fun little uh, side note that yeah. he adds in there. It's a lot of it is just sort of as he goes. He has a couple of little interesting ideas, and he and he tosses those out there, and that's one of them. So that's the kind of story I think is kind of interesting. But it is worth noting that I, I know that. Um, when uh, the what's called the new wave of science fiction came along in the 60s, uh, it was specifically a reaction to the sci-fi of this, basically this era, the 40s and 50s, uh, which they felt was very focused on, you know, how can we write it as a technical manual, basically. Mm-hmm. Which never went away entirely in science fiction. It's yeah, that, that well, it was... Space. I mean, hard sci-fi goes back uh, to, like, the 1700s. I read oh, yeah. A, I read a story... Uh, well, hard sci-fi for the time, right? Like cutting edge, they had just discovered the air balloon and the hot air balloon mm-hmm. and uh, the planet Uranus, right? So of course you'd take a hot air balloon to the planet Uranus, <laughs> of course. like it, yeah. Like these were cutting edge things at the time, but it makes yeah. no sense in retrospect. Gas travel to Uranus, yeah. Yes. Um, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I it know... was before it was called that. It I, was know, I know. I know. But they didn't what. The planet was originally called George Amsidus, named after King George. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, that's the original discoverer. Obviously, King George was not popular oh. uh, in retrospect, so... Right, yeah. Well, that I mean, they named them all after the, the gods, so it's a little interesting. Yeah, yeah. What, what year was that that they started uh, them? I thought well, it was 19th century? No, it was 1700s. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was uh, I guess late it 1700s. Been. Yeah. I guess it must um, have been if it's King George. Yeah. Um... I believe it was discovered by Sir William Herschel. I might be wrong on that. Huh. Or he was one of the people credited as discovering it. Okay. Um, oh, then your your uh, Neptune was uh, 19th century. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So uh, uh, it was later changed to Uranus, but it was originally George Amsidus. Right. We're getting off topic here. No, but, but, no, uh, well, that's, no, that's very interesting. I didn't know that, uh, that, that they changed the name of Uranus. But, they, but just, yeah, that's... I remember, yeah, people were always harping on about reality, and I know that's something Jules Verne was big about. Uh, oh, yeah, to, that's why used... I can't read. I, I I mean, I like... Well, he even know. specifically said to Jules, to H.G. Wells, he they had a big... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, of heads, I, I'm he more said, of a Wells guy than an H. Right, than a well, to Jules H.G. Verne Wells guy. real reads, I mean, to be fair, anything you read of Jules Verne is translated from French. Yeah. Uh, but he was very big on... Uh, uh, like he apparently, um, H.G. Wells has the, uh, the trip to the moon or whatever it is. Yeah. And he's, what's his, one Caverite. To the, yeah, he uses Caverite. And, and it's it, an anti-gravity material. Anti-gravity so. materials, which of course is also featured in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, apparently, uh, Jules Verne said, well, this is not science fiction. You just made up this stuff, Caverite, <laughs> that lets it work. Where is this Caverite? Show me your Caverite. That's yeah. what he said to him. And it's like, that's not the point of the story. Obviously, yeah. you're not... Whereas Jules Verne did the story where it's it fired out of a giant cannon. Right? Yeah, that was yeah. the idea. And uh, I think there was a, uh, a bit in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, one of the... Af- one of the um, post things. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you call that? A- a- so, yeah, back Matter. Back Matter. Uh, where... Uh, um, oh, what was it? The, um, Jules Verne character, um, what's his name? The Master of the World? Uh, Robert? Robert, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, it was just, escaped me. Um, says that, uh, the cat... How dare you not remember this 19th century <laughs> obscure character? Anyway, um, Phil. it said, Robert said, um, that, uh, the Caverite that Moriarty had used in the first story was really unscientific and he wanted to... <laughs> right, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that was a, that was yeah, a nod to how nod Jules to Verne and H.G. Yeah. Wells, yeah, had a big, had a big, uh, sci-fi nerd, uh, rivalry beef going uh, yeah. on about that. Yeah, so that's exactly it. Um... So this book is kind of, you know, it's it's nodding to all the absurdities of science fiction while also clearly he's got kind of the, the mind where he thinks through these kind of things, which mm. is kind of interesting. Anyway, um, do you had, did you have anything else? Oh, uh, we could discuss up, the or? ending a bit. Okay. Um, he, he manages, I mean, not, not to go completely, but he, it's a happy ending. He manages to go home, right. sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of like, uh, it reminded me of Back to the Future. 
right. where he goes back to a better version for right. him of the world yeah. that he lives in. Because yeah, in this right. world, he's already engaged to to Betty. Right. So uh, he imagined his world, but slightly better for him. Right. And he's the he's the editor of the well, magazine. Well, just just to I, set I mean, it up. he's the owner of the publisher. Right. Well, just to set it up, it, it's it, he. Literally, again, very, very quickly in the last ten pages of the story, uh, he he finally gets a hold of a spaceship. He goes out to Jupiter to meet Dopel. Uh, Mecky sort of figures out what's going on and how he's gone to an alternate reality. Um, maybe not ten pages, like twenty pages. It's, yeah, there's. It's very. It seems like when you're reading it, you're like, how are they going to wrap this up in such a short time? But they do. Uh, so they they come. They realize this theory of oh yeah, there's only. Were you expecting to be all a dream? Maybe I don't know what exactly what they're going to do. I've come across that, and it's always really frustrating. But, oh, of course, but uh, they, but they specifically say it's this not one a was dream, recommended. Like I mean, this through. one seemed to be well received, so I wasn't right. expecting that. No, but I mean, the, the the author goes out of his way to tell you basically it's not a dream yeah. halfway through, so you know that there has to be a resolution for it. Mm-hmm. I was just surprised at how are they going to explain it all in twenty minutes and send him home and everything. Yeah, but it's basically he meets Mecky and he meets Topel. Mecky goes. He tells them the theory, as we already discussed, how there's infinite universes, so there must be a, a universe that's exactly like what you expected it to be like. Uh, that what what you expected this uh, sci-fi uh, nerd fan to like. Uh, so he says, "Well, we can send you home, but you have to basically do a, a suicide run on the uh, kamikaze run on the Arcturan vessel. Yeah, uh, and when it when it hits, it'll create enough." Uh, power to send you back home and mm-hmm. in the meantime it'll win the war for us conveniently uh, yeah that's kind of a nice uh, that's a, quite an economy of storytelling it's the thing yeah. that will save everything in this reality and send you home at the same time yeah uh, it's like if dorothy had you know if water on the wicked witch had also sent her back to yeah. kansas at the same time so uh so he does that so but then as he's about to crash into the arcturan vessel he realizes like wait a minute you could and, and it's just whatever reality you're thinking of when it hits is what yeah. sends you there and he realizes that the last minute he's like wait a minute i don't have to go exactly home i could go to a home that's almost exactly the same but then it has this girl i like in it basically and, uh, and he was the publisher of the magazine and he's the publisher of the magazine yeah. just the editor yeah. so it's it's exactly it's the homer simpson episode where he keeps changing uh, yeah. time where he's he's uh, except instead of getting close enough he's like no i fa- it's it's the it's the world where it rains donuts for this yeah, time, yeah. basically <laughs> Where it's where it's, uh, is Patty and Selmer are dead? He's got Alexis yeah. Dan, and but they don't know. We've what all donuts seen are. The Simpsons. Yes, I know. <laughs> anyway, so it's that he does that, except he's able to consciously do it basically at the yeah. end, and that's the the last again last page or two. And it is actually really impressive how he wraps it up that quickly mm-hmm. uh, in a few pages, and it doesn't really feel rushed uh, to a, a huge extent. Like it suddenly. It it pays off everything pretty pretty abruptly. So I was yeah, probably, I, I was impressed. I by didn't that. think they had anything any loose ends or no really. Well, like I said, I just I, I thought like how are they going to win the war against the Arcturans and send him home in ten pages? Yeah. And they did it and ex- and explain exactly what the hell's going yeah. on in ten pages. And they did. And it was like I say, it's 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 even now reading it in two thousand eighteen because it is the year two thousand eighteen. Um, we uh, we. Um, like that is a clever idea now. Like it's not an idea that's old hat because they did it in nineteen forty nine. I think part of, uh, I mean, this is a really obscure book. So if I, I only heard about it, I can't even remember. I was searching for books with moon men in it and came across this, and it's not in my usual wheelhouse. But I, because hmm. it's it's a little yeah. later than I usually read. But that's uh, right. Yeah, uh, it seemed interesting to me, and I didn't read it until you brought up this podcast idea and yeah, I, yeah. I suggested it as a title and yeah yeah well we it's good. but you read it at that point right uh, no i read it after we discussed it oh really yeah okay so you said we should call it what bad universe but you hadn't read the book yet. yeah okay i just i just suggested that as one yeah yeah no well it's a good title and it's a good uh it's a good fit um uh just i want to talk about the chapter titles okay just or list some of them okay uh uh, yeah, it's, it is a very lighthearted book, and it's yeah. kind of, it's you know, there's serious parts. It's not a full-on comedy, but it's got kind of a whimsy yeah. to it. Everything. Yeah, the sewing machines rampant. Yeah. Uh, the dope on dopel, um, space word ho, mm-hmm. the moon. So what? <laughs> and uh, as we discussed, Huckleberry Infinity. Huckleberry Infinity. Yes. Huckleberry Infinity, another possible title for the podcast. No, <laughs> not really. We're not going to call it that. Uh, nobody would know what the hell we were talking about. Uh, but yeah, it's a it, it's a clever book. It's a, it's a good one. But yeah, it is interesting that it's never became 
super famous. Mm. Uh, uh, I did read a, a contemporary review, I think, that mm-hmm. said it was the uh, uh, the author set out to um, parody space operas and ended up creating the best one. Uh huh. Yeah. Like this is before Star Wars and Star Trek and all right, those right. things, but. Well, that's, that's, that's always been a feature of a lot of literature when you set out to do a deconstruction of it and then that becomes... Ab- like Don Quixote. Absorbed. Yeah, yeah. Don Quixote. It gets, it gets absorbed back into the thing that you're parodying and it becomes part of the tropes as yeah. well. Uh, like, um, what else has done that? Um, uh, well, Alice in Wonderland, it yep. was kind of a parody of kids' stories that mm-hmm. has now become the quintessential kids' story. Um, there's, a few, there's a few like that. But yeah, Don Quixote was kind of... A parody of the novel, I uh, believe. The uh, uh, gallant knight stories. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that is a, that is something that the, the book accomplished. But it just it is interesting that that premise of well, if there's infinite universes, which and it, they must have been talking about it even in 1949. It must have been a common thing uh, because the the book sort of assumes that oh yeah, that's a sci-fi trope that there's yeah. alternate universes. Yeah, I haven't come across it much, but I yeah. like I said, I usually read Victorian stuff. So well, consider that um, the Flash comic. This was you know a decade later, yeah. but they did the Flash of Two Worlds in yep. the late 50s. So again, it was a it was a cliche by then, or at yeah. least it was well established as a trope. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it must have been. Uh, it's fairly I think common. scientists were talking about it from fairly early on in the 20th century. So, Well, I, just even as a thought experiment, it's something you can think of. It's like a world where, what if something oh, had been uh, slightly actually different? Actually, I was thinking uh, the Blazing World sort of touches on it, possibly. Okay. Like, they, uh, there's some sort of, it's kind of confusing in the book. Mm-hmm. This is from 1666, mm-hmm. Margaret Cavendish. Right. Um, uh, a ship goes to the North Pole. And there's some sort of portal, and uh, you see multiple suns in the sky, yeah. and suddenly you're in another world. Right. So right. it's might be parallel universe. Well, that's not. But that's this is specifically the idea yeah, yeah. of a world where either history is different or it's kind yeah, of a copy history, of your world, yeah. and not even necessarily alternate history, but just it's our world. But there are things that are different about it. Yeah. Kind of um, uh, that I would consider. So that's something to, to try and figure out is when did they start yeah. writing about alternate realities? Because I'm sure they sort of talked about, like, uh, Lord Dunsany kind of deals with it to a certain extent. Uh, yeah. He has, I guess with him it's more time travel than specifically alternate realities. Yeah, but some of his One of his um, stories about the one guy going down the river of time and he goes into all the different doors. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. London in a post-apocalyptic London yeah. kind of thing. So that's not really... Uh, alternate realities in that same sense. So that this is probably still fairly early on in the concept of yeah. alternate realities, but they must have been doing it in the twenties and thirties. Yeah, because it doesn't it doesn't over explain it like you would expect for a new concept. Right, right. It deals with that idea of yeah that 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 was a science fiction idea. So that must have been all the rage in nineteen forty nine or whatever <laughs> that everyone's using it. Just like we're all doing nanotech now or yeah. uh, whatever um, quantum quantum something. physics. Yeah, exactly. So, anyway, okay, um, well, let's wrap it up. I think we've got a good uh, show here. But uh, Would you recommend it? I would recommend it, yes. It's a good, uh, it's, an, it's very interesting just uh, from the context of 1949. Just, yeah. again, it's to, to read something that, like I say, has that certain level of sophistication and that even has ideas that even by today's standards are like, well, that's a neat idea. I, I was expecting that, so... Um, yeah, it was. Yes, a, it was a, I think it was a good find. Uh, uh. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So anyway, um, that is what Mad Universe. That is the podcast uh, about pulp, and uh, we hope to continue doing these. Um, so from me and Phil, Phil, say goodbye. Say goodbye, Phil. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. So I'm not gonna uh, cotton to your <laughs> Fair enough. Me. Yeah, you. I can't. Sa- you can't sanction my buffoon. Oh, that was. I was trying to think of that. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay.